As everyone probably knows, the American Educational Research Association's annual meeting, which was scheduled to be held right about now, has been canceled. They did initially go to a virtual model that they were going to make available for free, but then backed off of that as the issues around the pandemic continued and they de realized or um, came to the notion that most faculty had enough on their plate as it was and they felt that participating in a virtual AERA conference would be just one more thing that they had to deal with and the organization essentially wanted to relieve them of that burden. I myself had two presentations that were scheduled for AERA, one of which would have been this afternoon. The other one would have been on Monday afternoon. So what I've decided to do is the nature of APA citations basically says that if the conference has been canceled altogether, that you can still list a presentation on one's curriculum vita or CV. And because of that, um, I felt that it was only right that even though there isn't a conference, if I'm going to list this on my CV, I should provide the session that I was going to provide anyway. So what I've done is here is the handout. It's a two-page handout, and I'll have a PDF of it attached to the blog entry uh, that this comes in, and you'll be able to download it if you're watching this on YouTube with the link at the bottom in the uh, description area. But essentially this was a presentation that was designed to be a roundtable. Now at AERA during a 90 minute session or 75 minute session there are usually four to six papers that are discussed as a roundtable and depending upon the moderator and often the guidance provided by the special interest group or SIG in some cases each person goes sequentially based upon that time so say if you had 90 minutes and there were six of you each person would have 15 minutes to just discuss things Another model is that everyone has some time up front, usually six to eight, maybe ten minutes up front to go over their paper. And then there's a collective discussion of all of the papers. And if you're in a session where everyone is sort of thematically tied together and the, the papers have a nice tight consistency in terms of the topic, that latter model actually works quite well. If you're in a session where everyone sort of has disparate topics, uh, the former model tends to work much better where you sort of do them in isolation. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to provide essentially the one page double sided handout that I would have provided for this particular session and then to spend six or eight minutes sort of talking through that handout and looking at the essentially topic I would have discussed there so that folks can provide feedback for me on this topic because this is a paper that I have in progress so this is something that I'm still working on. So looking at the paper itself the session was called Misbehaving Toddler or Moody Teenager Examine the Maturity of the Field of K-12 Online Learning and this is actually a topic that I've been sort of developing out over the past, I'm going to say, two years now, where I've been playing with ideas. I've written it out in a couple of cases where I've tried to incorporate it into something that I've written, but it either didn't quite fit in with the content or what was expected for that particular piece of writing. Um, right now, I will say that a version of this paper has been submitted for review to a particular journal um, and I've gotten uh, feedback on that uh, requesting some revisions so I'm hoping that if folks do have feedback on the content here that I can incorporate some of those ideas into the manuscript that I'm currently working on but the idea basically is that depending upon how you look at it the field of K-12 online learning, and just leave it at sort of online learning, is at least two decades old. You know, if you look at the different online programs that are out there, uh, 
you see, depending on what one you're looking at, um, they're beginning between 91 and 97, or 96, 97, to be honest with you, um, in terms of the supplemental programs. Um, if you look at the research in the field, the uh, recently um, I worked with a team of doctoral students from Brigham Young University looking at the research that was published in the field, journal articles essentially that were published in the field, and the first journal article that was part of that data set began in 1997. So, you know, and we're at 2020 now. So the notion that the field is still new or nascent and it's, it's, it's still developing is something that I would challenge in terms of a timeline. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the field is necessarily mature at this point. And... We actually have ways of, of measuring how mature a particular field is. So, for example, uh, Graham, Henry, and Gibbons talked about the maturity of a field being, you know, having a common terminology, widely accepted models and theories that would guide both the scholarship in the field as well as the practice in the field. Um, whereas those fields that are a little more immature still struggle to define specific terms and establish relevant models, which I think is a, a nice way of, of looking at it. You've got both common terminology and a lot of models and theories that guide both the practice and the research. And if you are mature, you have both. And if you're not mature, you don't have either, don't have one or the other. Um, Saba, who in the Handbook of Distance Education, basically looked at four areas. He talked about confusing terminology, which is similar to the first one, a lack of historical perspective, which is original, um, an absence of construct validity, which actually gets to some of the idea of models and theories uh, that Graham Henry Gibbs talked about, and then a postmodern term was the fourth item that he did. And what I've been doing with this manuscript that I've been playing with over the last two years is actually using Saba's description, so those four areas, and actually looking at how we're doing as a field through those four areas. And personally, I've added a fifth one in there, but I'm not going to include that in this particular presentation, but the fifth one is an American centricism, essentially that uh, the field is primarily focused upon or the research is primarily focused upon um, what's happened in the United States and not in other jurisdictions. Um, but looking at the four that Saba looked at, so let's take a look at the first of these, this idea of confusing terminology. And I think that's a, a useful one because even if you look at the way in which we describe the field up front, you know, we've got the private online school, we've got a cyber charter school, we've got uh, a, a e-school that um, still offers a lot of correspondence, we've got a supplemental online program, and even when we look at the official definitions project um, that the International Association for K-12 Online Learning which was the main professional organization in the field came up with. They couldn't even come up with a single definition. In fact, even in their definition of cyber school, they said it could be used interchangeably with virtual school, e-school, and online school. And when you looked at the entries for e-school and online school and virtual school, it basically, or those two, it had the same definition. And with virtual school, it actually just said see online school. Um, within... Um, in the latest edition of the handbook on distance education, I wrote that when you look at the field as a whole, most of the academics tend to use the term K-12 online learning, like I've used in the title of this presentation. However, you also see people that talk about virtual schooling. It tends to be used for supplemental, and cyber school tends to be used for full-time, but then, you know, you're, there's not consistent definitions over that. Um, so you get, like, the National Education Policy Center uses the term virtual school when they are referring to full-time online schools. However, anyone who's writing about Pennsylvania is using the term cyber school because that's the term that's used in the legislation or the policy in that particular jurisdiction. So when you look at, and all you've got to do is look at any issue of the Journal of Online Learning Research that is the main um, scholarly journal for our particular field. 
and see the variety of terms that are used in any single issue of that particular one by the authors. And in many cases, you can pull up a, a single issue. There's five articles in there, three of which are talking about a full-time form of online learning at the K-12 level. And three of those articles are all using different terms to describe what that entity is. So one of the things that we do clearly have right now is we do suffer from the problem of a confusing terminology or to use Graham, Henry's, and Gibbons language, we don't have a common accepted terminology that we're currently using. Moving to the issue of historical perspective, it's actually quite interesting. When um, Rick Furtick and Catherine Kennedy put together the Handbook of Online Re uh, uh, Handbook of Research on K-12 Online and Blended Learning, um, they mentioned twice in the, the introduction, actually it was within a couple of paragraphs of each other, this idea that the many of the folks who are doing work in this field come to the field as if they're brand new to it. They're discovering this area was the term that uh, Ferdig and, and Kennedy used. And it isn't an issue of, you know, I'm upset because you didn't cite me or you're upset because I didn't cite you. You know, there are some fundamental pieces in our field. If you even peg the field as starting sometime in the 90s, that just aren't included. And that's assuming you peg the field in the 90s. You know, if you think of the field being broader in terms of K-12 distance education and that online just happens to be the current medium du jour, if you will, all of the work that's been done around instructional film, educational radio, correspondence education, um, instructional television programming, um, educational satellites, audiographics, and telematics, all of that tends to be completely ignored. In fact, if, again, to use the main professional journal in our field, not to pick on them, because I've published in this journal many times, and I'm just as guilty of this practice as all of the other authors that have published in it, but as you look through that journal, you'd be hard-pressed to find people that are actually incorporating references to any of those legacy technologies of distance education and the things that were learned around them the theories and the frameworks that were developed using them. Um, even just the, 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 the lessons that we've learned from the research in those areas that just go completely forgotten um, when I and others are publishing our work. Um, similarly, looking at the issue of absence of construct validity. So essentially what they're looking at here is the use of validated instruments. That's where you're looking at construct validity. And the use of a validated instrument oftentimes is the first step in creating some sort of theoretical or conceptual framework. And there's sort of two ways to go about it. You can create a framework and then design an instrument that you want to use to test that framework and then try to validate that instrument afterwards. Or based upon, you know, you can create a, a validated instrument and then use that to develop the framework. Um, on both of those cases, we're really lacking in the field. Um, you know, with the exception of the educational success prediction instrument that Margaret Rovlier created, um, there's been very little use of uh, validated instruments beyond that. Um, you know, there was a, a single study that uh, a group of folks down at the University of Florida did that used a parental involvement mechanism model that had a validated instrument attached to it. Um, but for the most part, we haven't seen a lot else within the field. If we expand the field of K-12 online learning to in include blended learning, we've recently seen some efforts by uh, Charles Graham and several of his colleagues to try to create, uh, try to validate an instrument to measure uh, blended learning readiness among K-12 teachers, uh, but they're still in the initial stages of that process. And, um, you know, even if you look at the use of theory and conceptual frameworks in our field, uh, Jared Borup has been working on this ACE framework for a, a while. It used to be the um, Adolescent Community Engagement 
Now it's the academic communities of engagement uh, framework that the, you can see the reference here. The most recent one was an educational technology research and development article where they're trying to expand this particular conceptual uh, framework that they've used. Um, in the most recent edition of the handbook on research in K-12 uh, online and blended learning, we've seen uh, Anissa Vega and her colleagues that examined the research in the Michigan uh, Clearinghouse and found that only 17% of it had any reference to some sort of theory or conceptual framework or model. And when you look at the list of items that they included in there, many of the things that they very generously gave as being models, frameworks, or, or theories, in many cases weren't exactly those items or were things that uh, have largely been discredited like learning styles. Um, we have seen the use of theories from outside of K-12 online learning, looking broader at uh, educational technology and education in general. For example, um, the work of uh, Dickers and Whiteside in particular have used social presence theory in some of their work, but that's really all that we have to, to point at there. And again, um, really look through uh, any of the journal articles that you find as part of that analysis that uh, we did with the, the Brigham Young students. Uh, we looked at 350 odd articles and you know they're all listed online because we provided the uh, the database that we used uh, as a Google Sheet so you can go and actually access all of the original data and if you look through all of those articles there of the 350 odd that we have in there you'd be hard pressed to find more than a dozen that had anything more than a passing reference to some sort of uh, model theory or framework or and I think you'd be hard pressed to find any or beyond the ones that are specifically cited in the first couple of points here that used a validated instrument at all. The final item is this idea of a postmodern turn and um, depending upon the type of postmodern, Saba talks about two types, European and American. And in the European model, they talk about how it's this endless process of deconstructing the tenets of the discipline. And all you've got to do is really look at the way that INACO, or now the Aurora Institute, has evolved over the past two decades to see exactly this. You know, initially they were focused upon uh, online learning. They were the North American Council for Online Learning. And then with the, to accommodate a more broader perspective in terms of beyond North America as well as to incorporate the idea of um, blended learning, they became the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. And in the past eight years or so, instead of a focus specifically upon online and blended learning, even though they still claim to be, or still claimed to be the main professional association for practitioners in the field, most of their work focused on this idea of personalized learning and competency-based education, and that online and blended learning or online and blended tools were just a medium or a vehicle to accomplish this idea of personalized learning or competency education. And, and when you look at the way in which they describe this, and uh, it says on the handout there just to look at the our work section of their website um, and they have a wonderful document that looks at competency education, personalized learning and blended learning and tries to define I think it's called mean what you say and say what you mean or something like that. Um, as you read through the document you can actually get dizzy at times with the overlapping notion of these three concepts but that idea of continuously breaking it down um, the postmodern version, or sorry, the American version of postmodernism uh, tries to approach things from a uh, systems perspective. So essentially, how do these different variables relate to one another, and how can we create systems to help explain those things? Um, so when you look at the field, I mean, getting back to our discussion of 
the use of, of validated instruments, the use of models and theories and frameworks to be able to explain things. This idea of taking a look at the field and the research that's being done in it from a broader systems perspective is, again, something that's largely absent in the field. It's a real deficit uh, for the field of K-12 online learning. Everything is being looked at in isolation. So these concepts do at least appear based upon the way in which we've talked about the research to date. Um, we really haven't sought to create this web of relationships among these concepts. In many cases, they are seen as largely disparate concepts or disparate ideas that we're looking at. So, you know, the field really fails on this level as well. So, you know, if you take a look at these four aspects that we've had here, one of the things that you can say is that as a field, really, when we look at the things that people use to measure the maturity of the field, even if we are generous and say that the field doesn't start until around 99, 2000, when most of the states started to offer some form of online learning. Um, we're still two decades in, 20 years in, um, in this process. And the scholarship in the field easily has 20 years of articles and reports and uh, newsletters and books and chapters and you know, scholarship, essentially, literature that we can uh, you know, build upon. But when you look at those measures of maturity, the field is really found to be quite lacking at this point. And one of the things I would argue, and the reason why I've been sort of playing with this manuscript for so long now, is to try to both make a case and provide a mechanism for folks, um, you know, uh, other researchers in the field, to be able to improve the quality of scholarship in the field by allowing us to do some of the things that we are currently lacking in when it comes to the maturity of the field. So that's where we stand right now, and that's sort of how I see the field. I'd love to hear any suggestions that you have, questions that you have, feedback that you have on these ideas in the comments below. So please let me know what you think.